Mr. Hoyer, it was a very special pleasure to yield to uh, a man who is second uh, in our own, among our own Democrats here in the House. And I think that it was particularly appropriate as we close out this, se this session for our Democratic whip, our Democratic leader, to come to the floor to remind us of unfinished business. Uh, so it, was, it was a great pleasure to be able, therefore, to give time uh, to Mr. Hoyer, who speaks for us all, and I thank him for speaking not only to the nation's business, but to speaking to the business of the District of Columbia. He never neglects the city. He has been a great champion of, of the district and full freedom for the nation's capital. Uh, Mr. Hoyer essentially uh, spoke about the unfinished business. I opened uh, relieved at what the Democrats were able to accomplish in this conference report. Uh, when you consider that almost everything of great priority uh, for us was under attack. So yes, we are relieved, but what Mr. Hoyer has reminded us about this evening is that there is unfinished business that should not allow Congress to go home to celebrate its own personal Christmas with a clear conscience until they deal with this part of the nation's business. Uh, the payroll tax that will go up unless uh, we extend it, unemployment insurance for six million people, these would have been routine. These ingredients, the payroll tax, uh, for example, that economists tell us are essential to keep the economy from collapsing because that tax is going to be instantly spent. Uh, and if that payroll tax goes up instead of staying out, uh, there will be a full 1% decrease in the shallow, already shallow growth of the economy. Unemployment insurance does precisely the same thing. Uh, for every uh, four people looking for a job, there is only one job available today. Who would want to deny unemployment insurance? And as for Medicare, uh, we already have uh, too many physicians unwilling to take Medicare patients. The last thing we want to do is, is to uh, leave that situation. Uh, so that so many of our sen uh, seniors would have nobody uh, to go to. Um, Mr. Speaker, four residents were arrested uh, this morning in front of the Longworth building to protest congressional action to keep the district from spending its own local funds as it sees fit in this case for abortion services for low-income women. No one asked these residents to do it. There was a picket line. I went to the Longworth uh, there on Independence Avenue, joined the picket line, left, and then was informed that four people had decided to engage in civil disobedience in order to leave the Congress with the message that we will never go away quietly so long as you treat the residents of the District of Columbia as second-class citizens. These four joined 73, or is it 72, who were arrested the first time that the Congress attempted this very uh, rider. Um, they have been successful in this sense. While there is one rider, the abortion rider, there are no more. And yet there were attempts to put more riders, more attachments, at odds with what the residents of the District of Columbia themselves have enacted. And those were not added. There were riders uh, that would have um, uh, kept the district from 
using needle exchange programs indispensable uh, to eliminating the spread of HIV AIDS. There, there were promise riders on the district's marriage equality law, and there was a promise rider to eliminate all of the district's gun safety laws. Because district residents did not go silently the last time, uh, we have been able uh, to beat back those riders. We are relieved that the federal government didn't shut down because the district government would have shut down on Friday had the federal government shut down, although the District of Columbia is no part of this fight. The district's local budget was passed months ago. However, the Congress treats the district paternalistically and makes it bring its budget to people who know nothing about its budget and ha have contributed nothing to its budget. In order for the Congress, people from other districts to sign off on the local budget of a city not their own. So because the District of Columbia budget was locked within one of the appropriations and almost none of them had in fact been passed, the district faced a possible shutdown. I have had a bill here pending for many months uh, to the effect that if the government shuts down, the district can continue to spend its own local funds. That bill has not passed. It is, uh, uh, it is uh, amazing to, to even contemplate the possibility that the local government would have been shut down over issues having nothing to do with the local government. Well, there is only one way uh, to avoid that problem, uh, and it is a way that we are, are making at least some progress on, and that is to give the city the right to pass its own budget and be done, to, done for it. We are pleased that there is some interest in this issue, especially the bill uh, Mr. Issa of California uh, has introduced uh, to allow budget autonomy, a bill that mirrors my own in many ways with, of course, the deference his bill gives to the Congress, but it would go a long way toward avoiding shutdowns, uh, toward allowing the district uh, when it, in fact, uh, passes its own budget timely and balanced to go forward to have its budget done before school opens, to avoid having to pay a premium on Wall Street because the Congress forces the city uh, to bring its budget to the Congress, thereby creating uncertainty with those who hold our bonds. So there is a way, and it is a way that we will never give up until we get that way. May I ask how many, how much time remains? Lady has three minutes remaining. So as the, the, the residents of the District of Columbia look at the national appropriation, they will see the national conference report, they will have much to be grateful for. Uh, because the wholesale attack on, on everything from education to health care reform did not succeed. Yes, there were some uh, extraordinary and important, very good things in D.C. appropriation, even as the city is in anguish uh, that the Congress would dictate to the city how it must spend its own local funding. So the city is justifiably angry that there was one rider, uh, one amendment at odds with our own law forced upon us in the way of authoritarian uh, governments. At the same time, other riders 
that would have been terribly destructive, we were able to fi fight, o fight off. And the funding uh, was, in fact, salutary and, and mindful of, of the needs of, of the nation and of the city, especially the funding of the Homeland Security headquarters uh, in Ward 8, a ward with a high unemployment rate, uh, DC TAG, uh, which is the bill that allows our children to go to state colleges around the country because we do not have a state university system. And we are especially appreciative again of the funding for HIV AIDS uh, to engage in education and prevention uh, in a city that has a high AIDS rate. Uh, the Appropriation Committee has uh, tried to overcome the partisanship of the 112th Congress. Uh, it did so to a, uh, to a fair extent uh, on the uh, general uh, conference report, and it certainly did so on our report, uh, on our appropriation, the D.C. appropriation, notwithstanding, notwithstanding uh, those is the issues that we will continue to take with our appropriation until our appropriation is ours alone. Our appropriation, our money. My thanks to those who uh, in civil protest, uh, civil disobedience were arrested this morning uh, because of the rider on the DC appropriation. And my thanks as well to the hunger strikers who for the first time in the 210 year history of the District of Columbia made a very special sacrifice uh, as DC residents to indicate uh, how intolerable it is for 600,000 residents of the nation's capital to be treated as second class citizens. Happy holiday uh, to uh, all members of, of, of the House. May we have a bipartisan year next year. I yield back.